Well, I'd like to thank you all for showing up so early this morning. I know this was a, a bit of a stretch for many. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes this morning. And um, this is mostly a diagnostic talk because we have recently just changed the diagnostic criteria for the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. And I'd like to give you a little bit of a history about that and then uh, present to you what the new uh, criteria are. And I think that this is important information because um, patients and physicians will need to use it in order to establish these diagnoses and then to guide optimal management. So I have no conflicts to disclose. And before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge Laura Bloom and Shane Robinson at the Ehlers-Danlos Society and EDS UK, who have really been pivotal in getting all this information together, and my colleagues Brad Tinkle, Francisca Malfate, and Peter Byers, who shepherded the process of developing the new criteria and the publications that came out in the American Journal of Medical Genetics in March. And also, of course, to my patients and their families who allow me to participate in their lives. And thank you all for being here. The previous criteria for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome were established in 1997 at, a, at Villefranche in France. And they were published in 1998 in a paper that was the first author was Peter Byton. And in this, in this paper, there were six major criteria for the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. And at the time, the genes were known, the Cal5A1 or type 5 collagen is the gene that causes classical syndrome. Type 3 collagen causes the vascular type. And then the rarer types include the kyphoscoliosis, arthrochalasia, and dermatosporaxis types. And the genes for all of those are known. But in May of 2016, there was a symposium uh, sponsored by the Ehlers-Danlos Society and EDS UK. And the goals of that meeting were to build a revised nosology or classification that defines the diagnostic criteria for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, the goal, another goal was to define new EDS types where necessary, and then to begin the process by which the management and care guidelines could be developed for each subtype of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And there were four committees for the different types of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. There was a classical committee, which I chaired, and then the hypermobility committee, which was chaired by Brad Tinkle. Peter Byers chaired the committee on the vascular type, and Francisca Malfate chaired the rare types committee. And it's just interesting. We wound up with 13 types in the end um, for the 2016 nosology. And so Francisca shepherded 10 of those. The rest of us just had one each, so we were really slackers compared to her. And then uh, there were working groups for comorbidities and other issues that we know are associated with the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. So there was a group to consider the Byton score, which is the measure by which we look at joint hypermobility, and to decide whether should we keep the current scoring for joint hypermobility or should we expand it, um, and to look at the evidence behind those decisions. There was a group looking at physiotherapy, uh, orthopedic surgery, autonomic dysfunction and fatigue, because we know that POTS and other manifestations of autonomic dysfunction are really important manifestations in many people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Pain management, Dr. Pradeep Chopra chaired the, the working group on pain, and psychological aspects um, with Antonio Bobina. We had a separate group for GI involvement because although many of the manifestations in the gastrointestinal tract reflect 
autonomic dysfunction. There are some other issues as well. So um, Dr. Aziz chaired the group on gastrointestinal involvement. <laughs> And Fraser Henderson, who's a neurosurgeon, uh, chaired the neurology and neurosurgery uh, group. And then um, there was another group looking at allergy and immunology. And that group considered issues related to mast cell activation, as well as immunodeficiencies and um, IgE-mediated allergy. So this was really, uh, an effort to look very carefully and critically at the literature to date related to these issues as it relates to Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome to define what we know, what we don't know, and what research will be necessary to fill in those many gaps in our knowledge. So for 2017, these are the 13 types that, we, um, that emerged. Um, and again, we still have the classical type, the hypermob hypermobile type, and the vascular type. Of note, the what used to be called hypermobility type, we have now uh, changed to hypermobile as a name. And then the other types are much more rare. <clears throat> so I'm going to present to you the criteria for diagnosis for the uh, major types, the classical, vascular, and hypermobile type. Um, in 2017, we decided that the major criteria for um, the classical type should include skin hyperextensibility and atrophic scarring as one criteria, and then the generalized joint hypermobility as a second criteria. And just to show you uh, what our thinking is in terms of the, the skin, People with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome have mildly stretchy skin, but people with classical Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome have really stretchy skin. So, and this uh, picture illustrates that. And then um, you can see the scarring on the shins. These shin scars are very, very typical of the classical type of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome because the skin is very fragile, much more so in most of the other conditions. And um, it breaks. And when children are learning to walk, they walk into coffee tables, the skin will split, and then you get these scars. So the very fragile skin with really extensive scarring on, this, on the shins is really one of the hallmarks of this uh, type of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And then um, this slide from the Ehlers-Danlos Support Group in the UK illustrates the Biden score. And the Biden group did decide to keep the Biden score just the way it was and not to include things like shoulder hypermobility or hip hypermobility um, because they felt that the evidence was really not strong enough to support making changes that way. So for right now, we're still using the Biden score, which is a nine-point scale, which is the same as we've been using now for decades. And those nine points include just starting from the left on this slide. Can you put your hands on the floor when your knees are straight? So palms flat on the floor with straight knees. And then um, are you able to bend your pinky? At, this is the metacarpal joint. Can you bend it back more than 90 degrees? You get one point for each of those. Are you able to touch your thumb to your wrist? It's OK if you have to push it. Um, one point for each of those. Do the knees bend back more than 10 degrees? One point for each of those. And then the elbow extension. So if that goes more than 10 degrees beyond the straight. Um, you get one point for each of those. And um, the classical committee just said a score of five or more counts for joint hypermobility. When we talk about the hypermobile type, you'll see that they were a little more nuanced in their thinking, which I think was, was wise. So the minor diagnostic criteria for classical EDS include easy bruising, Soft, doughy skin, and the skin fragility that I mentioned, traumatic splitting. There are these things called molluscoid pseudotumors, which are little, they're like um, 
they feel like fatty tumors underneath the skin. They're soft and they're mobile, um, usually maybe two to three centimeters in diameter, or they may be a little ovo ovoid. Um, and then the subcutaneous spheroids also under the skin, but those are much smaller. They feel like little pebbles or calcifications underneath the skin. Uh, people may have hernias, uh, umbilical hernias, inguinal hernias. Um, epicanthal folds are seen in some people with classical EDS. And there are complications of joint hypermobility like sprains, luxation, subluxation, uh, chronic pain, flexible flat foot, and a family history of a first degree relative who meets the clinical criteria. That would be considered a, a minor diagnostic criteria. So to establish the diagnosis, we now use we have to see that skin hyperextensibility and atrophic scarring. Without that, we really don't consider a diagnosis of classical EDS. And then either the major criteria two, which is joint hypermobility with a Biden score of five or more, and the, or three of the eight minor criteria. So in theory, we could make a diagnosis of classical EDS without meeting that criteria of generalized joint hypermobility. But typically people will either have it or they will say they had it when they were younger, you know, if we're seeing an older person. Now, we are really recommending confirmatory analysis for any patient meeting the diagnostic cl clinical criteria. And this is molecular analysis of type 5 collagen genes, COL5A1 and COL5A2. This will identify a causal mutation in more than 90% of patients with classical EDS. And we really feel that it should be used as the standard confirmatory test. If you don't find it, it doesn't definitively exclude the diagnosis, but it should lead one to think about other alternative diagnoses. Now, for vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, the major criteria are the family history of vascular EDS with a documented causative mutation in type 3 collagen, so COL3A1. <coughs> arterial rupture at a young age, spontaneous sigmoid colon perforation in the absence of known diverticular disease or other bowel pathology like a, a malignancy, uh, uterine rupture during the third trimester in the absence of a previous C-section, and um, carotid cavernous sinus uh, fistulas in the brain in the absence of trauma. So the minor criteria, and I apologize that these are so small, um, bruising unrelated to identified trauma, and vascular patients, uh, people with vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome have very thin translucent skin with increased venous uh, visibility. It's almost like a road map, you know, when you look through their skin, you see the veins. There is a characteristic facial appearance not everyone with vascular EDS has it, but when you see it, it's kind of striking. It's kind of a triangular shaped face. And some of them will have kind of an older looking appearance. They look older than their age. That's the acrogeria. Um, spontaneous pneumothorax is seen in some. That's a spontaneous collapse, lung collapse. Um, and um, the talipes equinovarus or club foot congenital hip dislocations. The hypermobility in vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome may be limited to the small joints in the fingers. So when you feel the hands, they just feel like jello. Um, I saw a young man with vascular EDS last week, and he did not have any other hypermobility anywhere, but his hands were extremely flexible, very, very bendy. Um, you may see tendon and muscle rupture, keratoconus in the eye. Uh, the, the gingiva in the mouth may be very, very fragile and have recession. And then you see early onset varicose veins. Um, under age 30, uh, 
and even in people who have not had uh, children. So the Committee for Vascular EDS didn't lay out, you know, you needed a certain number of major and a certain number of minor criteria. They recommended that if you have a family history of the disorder, arterial rupture or dissection at a young age, unexplained sigmoid colon rupture or spontaneous pneumothorax, you should think about vascular EDS if the, other, the rest of the clinical picture is consistent with that. And testing um, for vascular EDS should be considered in the presence of a combination of any of the other minor criteria, because really the diagnosis of this condition rests on the identification of a causative variant in one copy of the type 3 collagen gene, which is called 3A1. So in this case, this is a diagnostic test, the, the, vas the um, molecular test. Now, most of the discussion that's gone on about the um, revised criteria has really centered around the hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome because these, these criteria are much more rigid than the criteria that we were using uh, prior to 2017. So the new criteria were really designed to emphasize the syndromic nature of this condition to reduce the clinical heterogeneity and to facilitate research into the underlying causes. One of the big issues that's still out there is we don't know the gene that causes hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or the genes. There may be many. Um, and part of the reason why may be that we're looking at a very heterogene heterogeneous group of people. So the thinking was, well, maybe if we narrow down the definition and look more closely at a, peop at a group of people who meet this more um, <laughs> specific set of diagnoses, then perhaps we'll have more success with that uh, gene search. So just to give you an idea, the criteria for 1997 for the hypermobile type, there were two major criteria and three minor criteria. The major criteria were the skin involvement with hyperextensibility, which is mild compared to the classical, and or smooth and velvety skin, and then the generalized joint hypermobility. And the minor criteria were recurrent joint dislocations, chronic joint or limb pain, and positive family history. And the paper that was published in 1998, all it said was the presence of one or more one or both of the major criteria is necessary for clinical diagnosis. So, you know, it didn't give us much guidance and it left room for a lot of people to be included under that umbrella. So with the new diagnostic criteria, we have three criteria and they're a little complicated and I apologize for this, but I hope you'll stay with me. So we need criteria one, two, and three. Criterion one is the generalized joint hypermobility. That's the Byton score, which I showed you the same Byton score that we use for the classical type. But the hypermobile committee decided that they were gonna change the cutoffs depending on age. And this makes a lot of sense because children obviously are gonna be more flexible in general than older people. So for prepubertal children and adolescents, we have a, a cutoff of six or more. For men and women, post-puberty and up to the age of 50, five or more, and then for men and women older than 50, greater than or equal to four. And the committee also decided to use something called the five-point questionnaire, which was developed by Rodney Graham and his colleagues in England to try to um, provide a little bit more flexibility and uh, into the diagnosis of generalized joint hypermobility. So if the Byton score is one point below the cutoff for age and the five point questionnaire is positive with at least two positive items, then you can still make that diagnosis of generalized joint hypermobility and meet criteria one. So the five point questionnaire is this one. Can you now or could you ever put your hands flat on the floor without bending your knees? So that gets to one of the Byton criteria. And can you now or could you ever bend your thumb to touch your forearm? 
As a child, did you amuse your friends by contorting your body into strange shapes, or could you do the splits? And as a child or teenager, did your shoulder or kneecap dislocate on more than one occasion? And finally, just do you consider yourself to be double jointed? And this questionnaire was validated in a large population of people with hypermobility, and it really has a pretty good predictive value for ascertaining who is going to be hypermobile. So the committee decided, okay, if you have two positive questions on answers to the questions on this questionnaire, you can add one point to the Biden, and um, that can help with the diagnosis of generalized joint hypermobility. Now for criteria two, we need two or more of the following features. We've got A, B, and C, and you need either A and B, B and C, or A and C. It's a little complicated. So for feature A, these are the systemic manifestations of a more generalized connective tissue disorder, and that gets to the idea of the syndromic nature of this condition. So we need at least five of the following um, elements. Unusually soft or velvety skin, mild skin hyperextensibility, unexplained stretch marks without a history of significant weight change, bilateral piezogenic papules on the heels. These are these little bumps that people get on their heels when they put all their weight on their feet and then they, the little bumps pop out. Um, and it's a manifestation of weak connective tissue because you have skin, then there's a layer of fat, then, uh, uh, then I'm sorry, skin, connective tissue, and then fat behind the connective tissue. And when you put your weight on your heels, the fat can kind of poke through that weak connective tissue. Recurrent or multiple abdominal hernias, uh, and atrophic scarring involving at least two sites and without the formation of those typical scars that we see in classical EDS. And then these are the rest of the systemic manifestations. So pelvic floor, rectal or uterine prolapse, dental crowding, and a very high narrow palate, Arachnodactyly, that's long skinny fingers, it's spider fingers from the Greek, um, as defined by a positive wrist sign and a posit or a positive thumb sign. So a positive wrist sign, if you take your thumb and your little finger and wrap it around your wrist, if it overlaps by the full phalanx, the full distal phalanx of your thumb the, beyond the knuckle, that is a positive wrist sign. You need really skinny wrists and long fingers to be able to do that. And the thumb sign, you put your thumb across the palm and put your fingers down like this, and if the thumb sticks out by that full distal phalanx, that's a positive thumb sign. So um, <clears throat> these last criteria are kind of getting to the morphinoid habitus uh, criteria that used to be considered in the diagnosis of the hypermobile EDS. So the arachnodactyly and the long arm span to height ratio. Typically when we measure the arm span and we measure the height, they're going to be very close to the same number. But if you have relatively long arms, relatively long legs, that is typical of a morphinoid habitus. And we use the cutoff of 1.05 as um, defining a long, re relatively long arms to height. And finally, mitral valve prolapse are uh, mild or greater based on echocardiographic criteria and aortic root dilatation. So if you have five of these 12 systemic manifestations, that is criteria A in the second set. Of, uh, it's feature A in the second criteria. So then B is a positive family history. That's easy. One or more first degree relative independently meets the diagnostic criteria for hypermobile EDS. And then feature C is the musculoskeletal complications. We need at least one of the following. Musculoskeletal pain in th two or more limbs daily for three months at least. Chronic widespread pain for more than three months. 
or recurrent joint dislocations or frank joint instability in the absence of trauma. So one of these count for feature C. So for criteria two, we need A and B, B and C, or A and C. And then the last criterion is, these are exclusion criteria, basically. We don't want the unusual skin fragility, which should prompt consideration of other types of EDS. We want to be sure we're excluding all other heritable and acquired connective tissue disorders, including the autoimmune conditions like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, those kinds of things. And also exclude alternative diagnoses that may include joint hypermobility because people have weak muscles that can't hold their joints together or other forms of connective tissue laxity. So the committee and the community recognize that there are a lot of people out there who have joint hypermobility but do not meet the diagnostic criteria. So they came up with this idea of a spectrum of joint hypermobility. And it's, you might think of it in a similar way to the autism spectrum. You know, you have people who are very profoundly affected by autism and others who are out there in the world and functioning very well. And so um, Dr. Marco Castori really spearheaded the definition of these different types of joint hypermobility. So finally, it's important to recognize that Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and the hypermobility spectrum disorders often present with complex phenotypes. Chronic pain, chronic fatigue, headaches, TMJ, autoimmune dysfunction, mast cell activation syndrome, and lots of GI problems and urinary issues. And uh, Heidi Collins, who was the chairman of the medical advisory board for the Ehlers-Danlos National Foundation for many years, coined the phrase, if you can't connect the issues, think connective tissues. <laughs> so um, papers about what we know about all of these issues are now available. The, the papers that were presented at the Ehlers-Danlos um, International Symposium in May are available through the Ehlers-Danlos Society website. And if you go to the Ehlers, Google Ehlers-Danlos Society, it's the first thing that comes up. And there's a link, and you can get all the PDFs. They're free, freely available until June. So if you're interested in the management recommendations, what we know, what we don't know, what the research that's required, all of those things are now available on that website. And this is, this is the, it's ellers-danlos.com and the link to the 2017 classification. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions if we have time.